scripture passage this morning comes to us from John chapter 1, verses 29 through 42. Hear the word of the Lord. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. I said last Sunday on the baptism of the Lord Sunday, the first words Jesus speaks in Matthew's gospel is his response to John the baptizer when John at first refuses to baptize Jesus. Jesus says, yes, John, uh, you should baptize me. It's necessary to fulfill all righteousness. And Jesus used the same word just before he died on the cross. It is finished. It is fulfilled. It is accomplished. The first word out of Jesus, words out of Jesus' mouth in the Gospel of John are, what are you looking for? Of course, Jesus said other things before this time. But the words that John chose for the first words out of Jesus' mouth in his Gospel are, what are you looking for? One day, the, uh, John the baptizer was with two of his disciples, and Jesus happened to walk by, and John the baptizer said to the, his disciples, look, look, here he is. This is the Lamb of God. Look, here is the one that I've been telling you about. You've been following and hearing and, and learning from me, but here's the one, the one whose, whose sandals I'm not even worthy to carry. And the two disciples who had been following and learning from John the Baptist, upon hearing that, walked away from John that day and began to follow Jesus. Now, the curious thing is that John the Baptist didn't get jealous or have hurt feelings that these two disciples left his congregation to join Jesus' congregation. But no, no, John the baptizer encouraged it. And the two disciples of John the Baptist, former disciples now, began to follow Jesus. And Jesus does a strange thing. When he noticed these two following him, he spun around on his heels and said, what are you looking for? Seems a bit discourteous, not the kind of greeting or welcome I would offer to potential members of my church. But Jesus cut through all of the niceties and gets down to business. And John, John the Beloved, the author of the gospel, not to be confused with John the Baptizer, who he's writing about, makes these words the first words Jesus speaks in the gospel according to John. What are you looking for? What do you want? Now, I was in a store several years ago, in a department store, <clears throat> when I overheard a fellow shopper say to her two children, a boy and girl, I'm guessing about nine or ten in age, okay, listen, we need to get a gift for grandmother. Let's think of a gift 
grandmother would like to have. It would mean a lot to grandmother if she knew you two helped pick out the gift. Without hesitation, her son said, a transformer. <laughs> now, if you're a little out of touch with movies and children's toys, which I typically am, the boy wasn't talking about something that hangs on a power pole. He was talking about an action figure, a toy from the Transformer movies. That with utter disgust in her voice that suggested she was now convinced that there was no hope for this child and her years of nurture and training to form an unselfish giving person was just a complete waste of time. The mother said, let's try again. A transformer is something you want. Let's think of something grandmother wants. Now, unlike this mother who was quite unconcerned and uninterested about what her son wanted, Jesus' first recorded words in the Gospel of John, Jesus' first words to his very first disciples were, what do you want? What are you looking for? Other translations put it, what are you seeking what are you seeking? Now, up until now in this gospel, <clears throat> the author wants us to know the story about John the Baptist and his message of baptism and repentance for the forgiveness of sin and that John the Baptist was, was the one to prepare the way of the Lord. But now, now the author, John the Beloved, the brother of James, wants us to step into the sandals of these two disciples now, John only names one of the disciples, Andrew, and most believe that the other disciple, the other one following Jesus that heard this question, um, and John hides this, and he does, is John himself, and he doesn't ever refer to himself. Remember later in the gospel, he says, and the, he refers to himself by saying, the one whom Jesus loved. So we believe that it's Andrew and John, John himself, who's writing this gospel, who was there receiving this question from Jesus. And John knows that, that we are a people on a quest looking for something deeper and more uh, meaningful than the experiences and the disappointments of this world. John knows our hearts are restless and that restlessness can only be quieted when we find a connection with the one who created us. John wants us to feel what he felt. John wants us to feel the weight of the question. He wants us to struggle with the question because the question comes from the one uh, he wrote about in the opening of his gospel. He said this, in the beginning was the Word. Said this about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, was with God, and the Word was God. On all these things came into being, including you and me, through him. And without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. This is the one asking the question, face to face, looking deep into our soul, asking, what are you looking for? John wants us to give serious consideration to what our answer to the question would be. Well, what are you looking for? Now, our culture has conditioned us to answer that question in a very materialistic way. Media and advertising has convinced us that we need the smartest, most powerful version of whatever is being manufactured this year. Our friends and our peers have it, and so we can't live one more minute without it, so we make it our own, even if it means living way beyond our means. What do you really want? And I'm pretty sure the context of the question didn't include material wants. The one we have come to worship today, who in the beginning was with God and was God, calls us, you and me, to examine our hearts and consider the question, what do you want? What are you seeking? Beyond the materialistic, that eventually loses its luster, deep down, what do you want? What are the true desires of your heart? If you 
had to prioritize and list five or six things you want or seek, what would they be? Now, God truly created us body, and of course we have material needs and wants, but he also created us mind and heart and soul. And we are not so shallow as to be totally consumed by materialism, are we? And we gather as worshipers every Sunday, perhaps to escape from the consumerism and the materialism, perhaps to escape from the worldly and renew our connection with the one who made us and be restored in his power and in his grace. And with the joys that accompany this hour, we also bring our sorrows. Some gather for worship worried about their spouse or son or daughter whose health is waning. Some gather here this morning unaccompanied by their loved one who, who is no longer with us. You know, material gifts cannot fill that empty void. And we bring anxiety and worry of an increasing threat of a dangerous world. Almost every day we hear of or experience events that, that shake the very foundations of our faith and cause us, causes us to view things differently. So it wouldn't take us long to prioritize the things we want that are most dear to our hearts. We want health and, and happiness for our family and, family and community. We want a, a wholesome environment to live and to nurture our families. We want our relationships with our spouses and our children to be strong. We seek opportunities for success and prosperity. We want to live in peace without the threat of violence in our nation and our world. We seek places to serve and give back and have an impact on someone's life who is less fortunate than we. And we want a right relationship with our Creator. Jesus asks, what are you looking for? What do you seek? No, what do you really want? Well, Jesus not only asked the question, but also, he also, but has also given us help in answering that question. Out of all of the teachings of Jesus, one of the most important directions he gave for our lives is this. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and seek first his righteousness. And the other things, the other things you seek, the other things you want will be added to you as well. Now, we have many wants. We have many worries. We have many ambitions and many anxieties. But Jesus says to us, seek first the kingdom of God, first the kingdom of God and, the, and God's righteousness. And your other wants will be added. Now, some clarity here might be beneficial. What, seek first the kingdom of God and other things will be added to you, does not mean, as some have grossly misused this text, is if you'll call the number on the television screen right now and pledge to send a, a donation to this ministry, God will bless you beyond measure with health and financial prosperity. That is exactly what this text does not mean and couldn't be further from the kingdom of God. Faithful seekers of God's kingdom are not always given good health and not always given great wealth. It also doesn't mean rid your lives of all of those ungodly wants and dreams and ambitions and seek only the kingdom of God. No, Jesus simply said, put seeking the kingdom of God first in your life in front of all of, the, all of those other things that you want and seek. Jesus simply said... Put seeking the kingdom of God first. Of course, if some of those things you are seeking are contradictory to the teaching of Christ and, and in opposition to the kingdom of heaven and God's righteousness, then yes, remove those things from your life as soon as you can. But seek first the kingdom of God and all other things you're seeking will eventually find their place in the ranking of priorities and sometimes those desires and wants will even just disappear completely. Now, you may be saying right now, Bruce, you don't understand. How can I seek the kingdom of God when 
my world is so hectic. I'm too busy. I'm too sick. Or I'm taking care of someone else who is sick. Or maybe I'm just too cool right now. I'm too fill in the blank. Or you may be saying, how can I seek God's kingdom when my life is such a mess? I, and you may be saying, I have disqualified myself a long time ago, and God doesn't want me anywhere near his kingdom. When Jesus said this, when Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, he was speaking to people that had the same hopes as you and me, the same types of dreams as you and me, the same types of ambitions. When Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, he was speaking to people with the same type of concerns, the same type of anxieties. He was speaking to people with financial concerns, with health concerns, with relational and marital concerns, parents who were trying to protect and raise their children in a world that seemed to adversely influence those children at every turn. Jesus was speaking to a people who lived in a dangerous and threatening world, a people who were governed by an unjust and ruthless rulers the people who were hoping and praying for liberation. The exact point of why we are here today worshiping the one who in the beginning was with God, but left the presence of God and took on human flesh and, and through his life and ministry and death and resurrection introduced into a fallen world the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God on earth, the presence of the one we have come to worship is here, is here, offering the kingdom of God that is available to everyone, everyone who will simply place their trust in Christ. The presence of the one we have come to worship is asking, what are you looking for? What do you seek? What do you want? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.